Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. COVID-19 continues to impact rural communities across the country and in some parts of farm country, cases are spiking. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America and the doctors from UNMC are here to help. Joining us tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, University of Nebraska Medical Center and world-renowned Dr. Chancellor Jeffrey Gold and psychiatrist Dr. Steve Wengel is joining us tonight as well. Thank you for being here. We know how busy you are. Dr. Gold, let's start with a broad overview of how the virus has been spreading across rural America. Well, Christina, you know, we have a combination of both good and bad news as it relates to the spread. I'm sure most of our audience is following very carefully the amount of uh, new cases that are being diagnosed and the very positive case rates, uh, test rates uh, that we're seeing uh, in states such as Arizona and Florida and Texas, uh, California and many others. And while the large cities uh, tend to be getting most of the attention, there is unquestionably continued spread and growth of the virus in even the smallest of our rural communities you know, think our very small uh, farming and ranching communities uh, as well. We're still seeing some outbreaks in, uh, in, in long-term care facilities uh, and in chronic care facilities as well. And those trends have really not changed. I would say what is the good news in spite of the fact we've had a number of days in recent weeks of over 50,000 new cases per day in the United States, which are our records. Uh, what we're seeing is a change in the demographics of the pattern. We're seeing spread into younger and younger people. For a long period of time, it was the 50 to 60 year old age group. And then over a period of time, that number went down and down and down until we're now seeing an awful lot of people in the 25 to 35, uh, 40 percent, uh, 40 year uh, age group as well. And of course, as we've discussed many times, these younger individuals uh, are more resilient they tend to recover more quickly from uh, COVID-19, lower chance of hospitalization, and very fortunately, a much lower chance of dying from the virus. So as a result of that, you know, a month ago, six weeks ago, we were seeing fairly high mortality rates, uh, well over 5%, sometimes in parts of the country, even 6 and 7% uh, from the virus. And now we're seeing mortality rates in the 2 to 3, maybe even 3.5% more widely across the country. What's unknown is whether these young people, particularly think the college age students, and we're gonna talk a little bit about back to school in a few minutes, what the school age children will do, when and if they get the virus, they're really well compensated for it, no hospitalization, minimal symptoms, looking well, feeling swell, but what's gonna happen when and if they spread it to their parents and grandparents, you know, their next door neighbor who's being treated for cancer. And that's really going to be what's going to determine how we're going to face this uh, in the next months to come. So I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have where we can dive deeper uh, into many of these areas. Absolutely. You talk about the next months to come. We've already been going through this for months. And so Dr. Wengel is a psychiatrist. We really look forward to getting some tips from you on how we can help work through some of these tough mental health aspects of the pandemic. Tell us a little bit, though, first off, about your background. Well, you know, I'm from Omaha. I'm a product of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, my proud uh, uh, home here where I've been uh, on the faculty now since 91. So I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. My patients are uh, 65 years old and older in general, and I see folks uh, who live in their own homes as well as long-term care settings. So I've been tracking on that pretty carefully too, the, the whole long-term care uh, setting issue that we alluded to, and we'll talk more about later, I think, too. But in addition to that, I have really an interesting job. Uh, I'm an assistant vice chancellor for wellness for both UNO and UNMC, and uh, I get to work with healthcare students, healthcare providers, our faculty, our staff, and try to uh, try to help folks with proactive stress management techniques, among other things. So the, the two worlds are really kind of coming together here in my own practice, as well as uh, kind of working with our trainees. 
Yes, and we have some very helpful tips that we're going to get from you tonight, which I'm really looking forward to. Our viewers have questions, and they are not packing any punches tonight. We're going to get started with Derek of Iowa. He says, I am a tractor parts dealer, and I work face-to-face -face with clients. Have you learned anything new about how the virus spreads, and does the amount of virus that you're exposed to impact the severity of illness it causes? I'm wondering if shorter conversations are needed even with a mask. Yeah, well, there are a couple of points, Derek, I think that are worth making. One is that just recently, there's been a number of questions asked as to uh, whether this virus is spread traditionally through droplets. You know, uh, the spread of any disease is broken down into multiple categories. Disease is spread through contact, disease is spread through body fluids, Disease can be spread through droplets that you cough or sneeze, or when you speak loudly, you project droplets uh, with your voice. Or disease can actually be spread through the air. Uh, that's called airborne or sometimes called aerosolized spread. And there is data, there's at least some scientific data that says that the tiny little droplets that we see uh, that can be projected when you speak or cough uh, can be uh, trapped in the air, and they can go large distances in the air. But the, as you know, uh, as the distance gets larger, the density, the concentration of these droplets goes down significantly. And so while we may be able to project these droplets a fairly significant distance, uh, as would occur you know, in diseases such as measles, as, as this graphic shows, the actual number of live virus particles that, that actually can cause an infection, Derek, are actually much smaller. And so distance does matter. And while we've talked a lot about six feet, and six feet is the traditional number for droplet spread infections, uh, there's some data that you can collect virus now from eight feet, 10 feet, even 12 feet away. But the actual amount of virus that an individual projects from a cough or sneeze uh, is nowhere near as high as it is in the, in the closer distances. So my message, Derek, I guess is pretty simple, that masks prevent the spread of droplets, they present the spread of aerosolized materials, and it doesn't make any difference whether they're cloth masks or paper masks or, or even our professional masks. You know, the denser the mask, the tighter the fit, the less progression of the virus we're going to see. And it, indeed, you know, what you're probably also interested in, Derek, is about surface spread of the virus. And of course, what we mean by that is there's been a lot of literature that says if people cough or sneeze on a tabletop or a bathroom fixture or even in a food store, uh, that people can run their hand across that surface, uh, touch their face, and then contract the virus from that. That is still true, but it's been shown that the virus doesn't last as long on these surfaces, particularly in the warmer, more humid weather, and that we're particularly concerned more about human-to-human -human transmission. So the cough, the sneeze, all the things that social distancing, all the things that wearing a mask can prevent. Okay, excellent. That, that was a tough question. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it, Dr. Gold. Let's bring you into the conversation, Dr. Wengel. The mental health challenges that have come with this virus, they have been overwhelming for some people, including myself. Talk about the relaxation response and the importance of trying to maintain a routine right now. Yes, I think those are two really, really helpful things. Uh, you know, there's a number of things that can be really helpful for managing stress, whether it's from a pandemic or, or what have you. But I think those are two particularly good ones. So the relaxation response, that's a term that was coined actually uh, by a Harvard University cardiologist, not a psychiatrist, interestingly, Herbert Benson. And he um, studied uh, using meditation, which is basically what this is, this is a form of meditation, in his patients with high blood pressure. So even back in the 70s, he was researching that and finding that some people with mild cases of high blood pressure could actually sometimes get off their medication by meditation. And he was really struck by that, saying, gosh, I, that, that is not uh, the way we usually treat this illness. Again, I'm not recommending people with high blood pressure stop taking their medicine, incidentally, but I just, uh, you know. I'm glad been, you're not doing yeah, that. Yeah, thank you for that disclaimer. Yeah, I want to be, be 
clear about that. But you know, it's really interesting. The point being that it really th this, these techniques actually have physical manifestations. They can actually help various parts of the body work better. So basically, Dr. Benson would say that you know we have these two different systems in the body. What he calls the stress response, or I also can call you know also term the uh, fight or flight response or uh, in medical terms, we refer to the sympathetic nervous system being activated. Um, and we all know that. that. That's something you don't have to train. The first time when you're a young child and you touch a hot stove or something like that, you know, you know your stress response just automatically ramps up. Your heart rate starts increasing. Uh, you feel anxious and nervous and all that sort of thing. You don't have to train that one. But interestingly, we all have this opposite and kind of mirror image system called the relaxation response. We all have it. It's hardwired, but you have to train it. It's kind of like practicing a, ba a basketball layup or something like that. you got to practice it. The more you practice it, the better you get at it. Okay. Um, that so... Oh, no, no, no. I was wondering if you could you can unpack it a little bit more because some people, they hear meditation and they think, oh, well, that's something that I'm not ever going to do. I don't know how to meditate. Maybe you can describe the benefits a little bit more, the value that it holds. And, and for someone who, who might be a little bit skeptical, talk about how it's done and maybe show us how it's done, if you will. You know, Steve was going to talk about it in a second, but I just want to tell you and tell the audience that until a number of years ago, I was also a skeptic mm -hmm. about meditation and as a way of inciting the relaxation response. And I have become a believer, and I do try to find at least one to two times a day where uh, I can uh, close my eyes, put my feet squarely on the ground, and take some deep breaths and try to uh, incite this uh, relaxation response. And, you know... Uh, Dr. Wengel will give us a lot more detail on you know, the science of it and how to do it, but it is definitely worthwhile. And I think it's great for our audience, even without the pandemic, and now certainly with the pandemic, uh, it's worth considering. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm delighted to hear you're, uh, you're, you're doing that, Dr. Gold. So, yeah, it's, you know, meditation, right, it has a lot of baggage and, and people think it's kind of, uh, you know, regardless. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it can uh, sound confusing or hard. It's really not hard. It's actually really, really simple, uh, at least the form I do. So there's a form I've been doing, the, the, basically the form they teach at Harvard, and I've been doing it for about 40 years. Uh, about 10 minutes a day, really, is uh, kind of the dose that seems to work. For most folks, like exercise, more is better, but 10 minutes a day will do the trick. And if you don't have 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, basically pretty simple. First of all, you have to have a word to focus on. That's kind of what makes this whole thing work is you focus your mind on a word. And the word I recommend is the word one. It's boring and it's repetitive. And that's what you want in a focus word, something that's kind of boring and repetitive. Dr. Gold already mentioned, you know, he mentioned doing it with your feet on the floor. That's what I recommend too. Do it sitting up. You might be tempted to do it lying down in bed, and you can. It, it will probably help you fall asleep faster, but frankly, it's so relaxing, you'll probably fall asleep before you get your 10 minutes in. And so uh, while sleep is a good thing, uh, if you want to get 10 minutes of meditation, do it sitting up. And preferably do it with your feet flat on the floor, as Dr. Gold said. For some reason, it works a little better if your legs are uncrossed. Uh, when you do it, it works best if you close your eyes and then basically just take slightly deeper and slightly slower breaths than you ordinarily would. And here's the other key. So as you're exhaling, you say that focus word, the word one, uh, not out loud, but just inside your head as you exhale. And ideally, you know, make that one a really long one. So when I do it, I take a breath in, and then as I'm exhaling, I say one, make it really long, as long as the breath going out. Again, not out loud, but just inside your head. That's it. It couldn't be simpler, really. Uh, but like a lot of things that are simple, you know, it takes practice. In the first week or two that you do it, uh, you'll probably find that you get pretty distracted. You know, you lose focus of your breathing and the word and you start thinking about bills you have to pay or dishes you have to do or whatever and that's absolutely normal. And you'll think, gosh, this isn't working. But I always advise people, give it a week or two. Do it every day, five, ten minutes, and after a week or two, you'll kind of get the knack and you'll say, wow, that's, I'm feeling calmer. Huh. I think some of us have been doing that, but we just maybe didn't realize that's what we were doing. Because I know that we have a lot of faithful people out there across rural America who do pray, but to know how that prayer can actually bring a calming effect. Can you unpack that a little bit more for us, right. if you will? 
it's, it's interesting you say that. I think most faith traditions I'm aware of have some form of uh, kind of meditative practice. They don't necessarily call it meditation, but, uh, you know, they do. Repetitive prayers and things or like silent that. Silent prayers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a, you know, it's a form of reflection and it focuses your mind on something very specific. And it's, it's, if that works for you, I fully, really, really encourage you to use that. The word one is a secular version of that. And so it's either one. They, 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 it all works. It all works. The whole idea is to really deliberately focus your mind on something other than the sort of typical fretting and stewing, as I put it, that most of us tend to do. That's kind of the brain's natural default is to kind of fret and stew about things. There are and enough things to fret and stew boy, about these Isn't days. that true, right? You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, neuroscientists will tell you that's, you know, our brain has evolved over the years to sort of have apprehension as its kind of default. And as Dr. Gold said, I mean, boy, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and that just get, gets ramped up. So these various techniques are just ways of, of kind of retraining your brain in a different direction. In a healthier direction, I would imagine as well, if you can reduce right. that stress level, that's going to benefit your overall health. But I'm not the doctor. Our next question comes from Wayne in Oklahoma. Let's listen. I know that cases of coronavirus are going up, but it seems like the fatality rate is going down. Is the virus weakening as it spreads? Thank you. Yeah, Wayne, well, there is uh, very little question that the pattern of spread of the virus uh, continues to be, as we said earlier, from, uh, from you know, person to person. And I think that we've seen that the uh, early reopening of our uh, cities and our towns and our farms and ranches uh, to guests, to, uh, you know, the great outdoors, as, as much as it's attractive now that the weather has become warmer, uh, we're continuing to see uh, social gatherings and other ways uh, that the virus continues to spread. And so, uh, you know, this has got to be a blend. You, you can never say to folks, or you shouldn't ever, I think, say to folks that you, you can't gather with other people, but you want to do it safely. You want to do it wisely. You want to make sure that we maintain the full social distancing uh, as much as possible. And at the same time, uh, again, we, we still strongly believe that masks are protective. And they're protective for a number of reasons. One, as we said earlier, it really stops the projection of micro droplets and aerosolized spread of, uh, of all viruses uh, that are transmitted from, you know, that are respiratory viruses. Uh, they also, of course, keep you from uh, touching your face. Uh, they're a constant reminder about that. But they're also a good reminder because it's not only what you wear, but it's what you see other people wearing uh, that relate to uh, uh, things like hand cleanliness. Uh, you know, it's been well shown that people that wear masks wash their hands more often. It's been well shown that people that wear masks are more vigilant about social distancing, about maintaining the six-foot distance. As you, you know, the audience might notice that uh, Dr. Wingle and I are sitting more than six feet apart tonight. And, uh, and we're very conscious of that here, just to try to, first of all, set a good example but secondly, to be sure that we're as safe as we possibly can be, and uh, not that I'm terribly worried uh, personally about getting infected, but I am certainly concerned about uh, sharing the virus with other people that would be far more vulnerable. So uh, these are the simple things that we've been talking about, you know, going back to the very beginning of this pandemic spread across uh, China and then across Europe and now across the United States. And until we have a vaccine or an effective antiviral and we can get a large uh, population immunized, we're going to have to stick to this stuff and we're going to have to be responsible for it. All right. Well, vaccines are a very big topic. People want to know, and we're probably going to get this question until they actually come out, Dr. Gold, when will the vaccines be available? So we are going to dive right into that question when we come back. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and joining us tonight, psychiatrist Dr. Steve Wengel. Our next call is from CK in California. Let's listen. Hi, I'm wondering about the timeline for vaccines. 
when do you think they'll be available in rural California? And how long will I have to after getting vaccinated? Thank you for taking my call. Yeah, I saw lots of questions about vaccines filling the newspapers and the evening news. So uh, last time I checked, uh, there were approximately 125 vaccines in, under laboratory development and laboratory testing in the United States. There were approximately eight that were in what we call phase one testing, which is the, uh, uh, most, the largest combination of safety testing. And then as we moved along in phase two, we're up to 11, as you can see in this graphic. And phase three, uh, there are now up to three different vaccines. So each of these phases is a different type of testing. The earliest phases are safety testing uh, in the most uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, the second phase is uh, safety testing in some of the older, more vulnerable populations. And of course, phase three testing is what we call efficacy testing. That is to say, does the virus uh, actually be prevented from infecting you uh, if you've been uh, immunized? There's been one vaccine that's been actually approved. It's in uh, use in uh, various parts of the United States and in various parts of Europe. Uh, it's an older type of vaccine uh, that's actually been used to immunize against other illnesses. And there is some preliminary data, actually, that long-standing vaccines for diseases such as polio and, and measles and, uh, and other uh, attenuated live virus vaccines can actually enhance immunity and prevent a severity uh, of flu and possibly even for COVID as well. But your question of how long does it take? Well, it typically takes a minimum of uh, three to five days and probably is going to take more like 10 to 14 before people get a good solid response to their vaccination. Indeed, most of the public health people and the vaccine developers are saying now that it may actually take two doses of the vaccine, mm. meaning you get vaccinated and come back in uh, two weeks or four weeks or something like that and get a second dose. Not totally dissimilar to what we do with influenza vaccine in the United States. We've learned that particularly in the older generation, who tend to be somewhat less uh, immune uh, capable, that is the fancy medical way of saying that they don't respond as aggressively to vaccine as some of the younger people do, uh, do take more than one dose. And when they get their second dose, uh, uh, that gives them sustained action. So in, a, in the over 65 group, for instance, we frequently do flu vaccination in the early fall, and then again uh, in the <clears throat> midwinter months, late January, uh, early February to get through the total flu season. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, the uh, older, more vulnerable populations will be among the first to receive the vaccines when they come out, which hopefully will be uh, sometime around the winter holidays. And then it'll probably take us, I would say, a minimum of a year to work through the rest of the population of those that we're going to plan to immunize. So I hope that uh, provides some information for you. Yes, it really is very helpful. That is the number one question that we get for you, Dr. Gold. Each and every week, people want to know about the vaccine. I think a lot of people are going online and looking for information themselves, and that can lead to information overload entangled with misinformation, of course, which can only add to the uncertainty and the stress. This has been an issue for many of us. Dr. Wengel, what tips do you have as we deal with this influx of information as we just try to stay current with the virus and how it spreads? Yes, I think that's really an important question. Um, <clears throat> information overload, I think, is a thing. And it's, again, certainly not new uh, right now. It happened before the pandemic, too. But certainly now, I think uh, uh, it's, it, it is a very, you know, a very real thing and, and fairly stressful for some folks. So these are some things I recommend uh, to people. One is, uh, you know, like on my in my case, on my phone, I shut off the email alert so I don't get pinged every time an email goes off. I check my emails regularly, but it I do it on my terms rather than the phone sort of demanding that I do it at a certain time. 
you know, I work hard, uh, but I also, you know, don't check my email after a certain period of time. And I recommend people maybe don't uh, check their email or do other things that involve a lot of screen time for an hour or two before bed, if possible. Uh, there's some evidence that the blue light given off by screens, whether it's phone screens or TV or uh, computer screens, um, may kind of keep you up at night or at least uh, cause more sort of arousal of your brain. And then the other thing I really recommend is folks uh, do two things. First of all, use trusted sources of information. Uh, I happen to be proud of our institution, and we provide, of course, uh, excellent information, but also historically Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization websites have been very uh, helpful for folks. So find trusted sources. As you say, Christina, there certainly is, is mis misinformation about, and that can just... Uh, uh, cause more stress and anxiety. So find good sources of information, but also I look at information as as uh, sort of like a powerful medication or powerful drug. You know, you need it. We need information. Uh, you know, we don't want to bury our heads in the sand and not keep up with things. By the same token, too much of a powerful medication can lead to an overdose. So, for example, I recommend to my patients maybe uh, checking whatever their news sources, maybe 10 minutes twice a day or something like that. There's nothing magical about that time, but instead of, you know, sort of relentlessly checking every hour, that's for a lot of people too much, and it just kind of drives their anxiety and their fretting. Yeah, you know, one of the pieces of advice that we've given folks uh, that has worked actually for me and for mm -hmm. others is have a fixed period of time during the day mm -hmm. when you're going to check the news sources, uh, right. updates and things along right. those lines. And that way you, you, it's not like you're going to forget it right. or, or not get to it. And that sort of frees you during the interval between right. that you can be more productive and not be distracted mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, wondering what's the latest news or mm -hmm. whether the news you're going to get is accurate or, or not. Yeah. So, uh, you know, all kinds of good advice. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I'm just curious of the psychological impact that that can have if, say, you are just watching the news all day long, constantly being fed contentious stories, being fed difficult stories to watch, because oftentimes the news covers hardships and, and the tough times that people have to go through. If you're doing that all day long, how does that impact your psyche? So... Sorry, jumped no, right in there. Go but, ahead, uh, Steve. You know, that actually reminded me uh, that uh, they, uh, there was a study that was done in China after the pandemic. Of course, that was where the pandemic started. And so they're starting to, uh, we're starting to see publications in the scientific journals now of looking at kind of the mental health uh, and other impacts of the virus. And so the study in China found that folks that had really high levels of social media consumption, uh, had twice the rates of anxiety and depression uh, compared to folks with sort of average or low uh, utilization of social media. So again, social media can be very helpful. It's a great way of getting information, but you have to use it, I think, judiciously and carefully. Absolutely. And uh, we really have to Take time to rest as well. I think that's something that we all have to try to do, have things to look forward to. Talk about the other side, if you will. Sure. Go ahead, Steve. I so I fine. kind of, I'm sorry, I missed the Oh, I'm just talking about there. the importance of, of resting your mind, just, just finding oh, time yeah. to let your mind rest. Yes, and, and that can include sleep, which we can talk about, but also just kind of relaxation during the day. So over in, in addition to doing, if, if you choose to, and I hope people do, you know, some form of, uh, you know, kind of relaxation response or meditation, but just other, other things, you know, hobbies are, are important. That's one of the positive things, I think, about the pandemic. Some people are getting back to things that they used to do, but maybe got busy and stopped doing, playing a musical instrument or, you know, doing things like that. People are reconnecting with family and friends that maybe they've lost uh, touch with because they've gotten busy and uh, that sort of thing. So that's a form of, I think, relaxation too. Listening to music, um, reading, you know, reading for pleasure. Some people are kind of getting back to that, that have kind of put, put the book on the shelf, so to speak, but they're, they're taking the book off the shelf again. Exercise, too, I think is uh, really a very, very potent way to relieve stress. Good for the body, we know that, of course, good for the heart and the muscles and, uh, and all the rest, but there's actually lots and lots of scientific evidence that physical exercise, whether it's weight training or aerobic activity like walking, running, swimming, bicycling, uh, is really good for the brain. It makes your neurons, the brain cells, stronger. It makes them communicate uh, 
together better. Some people refer to exercise as miracle grow for the brain. You know, it actually makes brain cells healthier, but it also just makes you feel calmer and, and uh, uh, more content in general. All right. Yeah, this has been a really tough time for a lot of people. And some people, they are also dealing with the flip side. They're locked in the house with the person that they love. But when you spend so much time with that person, that can create a number of problems as well. So just finding that time for personal rest, I think that's important as well. I really appreciate hearing those tips. We just need to hear it from a doctor sometimes. Our next question comes from Ryan in Texas. He says, when my crew is out working in the sun, our masks get saturated with sweat. Are masks still effective when they get wet? Yeah, Ryan, uh, you know, the, the answer to the question is they're better than nothing, but they're less effective when they're wet. And that's because uh, viruses, uh, bacteria, etc., pass through moist surfaces pretty readily. And so what you would really want to do is when you're working outside, and you know there's a lot of humidity in our breath. We, uh, as we exhale, we, uh, our breath is humidified by being passed through our lungs and our uh, nose and our throat. Uh, so even if you're not working and even if you're not really sweating a lot, uh, you are going to get your mask uh, humidified and you are going to want to change it uh, when that happens. But, you know, uh, that's one of the issues that we uh, are particularly concerned about in, in athletes uh, uh, because as they uh, compete or as they practice uh, or work out, they are going to sweat and, uh, and that is going to get their mask wet. And when their mask gets wet, they're going to be at somewhat higher risk of transmitting virus, particularly mm -hmm. if their mask is wet and then they cough or sneeze. It can project the virus particles uh, almost directly uh, through the mask. So I, I guess if I were to uh, put this into a priority order for you, Ryan, I would say a dry mask is best, no mask is worst, and a wet mask is somewhere uh, in, in the middle. All right. But nonetheless, always have one on you is the moral of that story. Have that mask on. Or, 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 maybe, or maybe two, Christina, you know, just yeah. in case you're doing something that you know, it was very physically intense, uh, have that extra mask with you. All right. And I love that tip that you gave us last week about if you are going to be traveling on an airplane, have an extra mask with you. That's a great one. Okay. Our next question is from Dawn in Minnesota. And she says, we're taking a road trip with the grandkids from Minnesota to the Oregon coast, and we'll be making quite a few stops in the RV. How can we best avoid the virus on the road? Yeah. So, uh, the minimal number of stops, the better. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's, whenever you travel with the family, you're always looking for the scenic route, of course, and uh, you want to stop and take every picture you possibly can. And, uh, and of course, you're looking for places that you can spend the night that are safe. Mm. Uh, you know, my, I, my best advice is to minimize the number of stops, to minimize the number of hotels, restaurants, restrooms, uh, et cetera. Travel with a good supply of, of uh, wipes uh, of, of various types and various sizes and uh, use them uh, liberally. Uh, make a special point of uh, hand washing. Mm. And certainly uh, when you're out of the car, uh, particularly when you're with other people that you don't know, please, please be sure to wear your mask, maintain social distancing, etc. And then if you are going to spend a night in a rest stop or a hotel or wherever you're uh, going to be uh, camping, if that's what you're going to be doing, uh, take an extra amount of time to use those wipes liberally. Uh, you know, vanity surfaces in the restrooms or uh, handrails and, and things mm -hmm. like that. And particularly, you know, if you're, you know, I don't know how old your grandkids are, Don, but uh, mine are about four. They're going to be four in a few weeks. Uh, you know, I'm particularly concerned with what's on their hands. Uh, and so uh, a lot of time and effort because they're touching stuff that you and I may not be touching uh, as we make these stops and, uh, and travel across the country. So take a little extra time uh, to make sure that their hands are, are extra clean as well. All right, excellent. A lot of people opting for the great outdoors instead of Disney because we just don't have that option in some cases with limited occupancy. All right, next up, Cletus from Kentucky. Let's listen. If I get coronavirus, is there, a, is there anything I can do to get it over with? Like, I don't know, breathe steam or drink water? 
or get some medicine. How does that work? Uh, thank you. Yeah, Cletus, you know, uh, a lot of work has been done on how to expedite, how to accelerate the recovery from this. I think right now the best that we can do uh, is to try to do everything possible to keep you out of the hospital and keep you out of uh, harm's way from uh, spreading the virus to other people. And so the best advice is to take care of yourself medically and to take care of yourself emotionally. <coughs> On the medical side, you know, you want to get plenty of sleep, you want to get three good meals. Uh, I always recommend vitamins. Uh, you know, uh, I happen to be a personally believer in, uh, in vitamin C and vitamin D and, uh, you know, multiple vitamins. Uh, I happen to be a big believer in fresh fruit and vegetables mm -hmm. and, you know, in a good balanced diet. Uh, again, uh, you know, you want to be extra sure that uh, you, you stay in touch with your healthcare care professional because one of the things we've learned about uh, COVID-19 is people can go from minimally symptomatic and feeling relatively well to feeling very short of breath and ending up in an emergency room in short order. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we recommend is uh, using one of the smartphone apps. There are many of them uh, out there. Uh, we happen to like the one that we've developed, which is called One Check COVID, but uh, there are many of them that just give you some insight as to... Uh, you know, they ask the critical questions. What's going on with your symptoms? How short of breath are you? How high is your fever? Uh, what's going on with, uh, you know, simple things like, are you getting enough nutrition, uh, et cetera? And, uh, you know, we hope that, uh, you know, that your symptoms remain minimal. But if you take care of yourself, uh, you'll be back in, you know, five to seven days and, uh, you know, doing most of the things you want to do. We think that you'll stop shedding the virus sometime around uh, 10 to 14 days, which is the usual period that we recommend in terms of back to school and back to work. And then, as you know, I'm sure Dr. Wengel would say, take care of yourself emotionally, right? For sure, for sure. It does matter, you know, <clears throat> the immune system is, uh, you know, tied into the brain in some really interesting ways. And there's actually some scientific data that shows that, uh, you know, when we're under stress, our immune system sometimes does not work as well as it does when we're not under stress. And so I think, you know, stress management techniques like, again, meditation, if you choose to do it, exercise, uh, or, you know, uh, social contact when it's, again, in a safe way, you know, respecting social distance uh, rules, um, you know, all matter. And it really does help um, help your psyche, but also help your body in general, too. Yeah, you know, it's that it's that overall wellness that we're looking for right now. And there's a four R's of wellness, I do believe, hoping that you can talk us through those four R's of wellness. Right. Well, I like things that are easy to remember, and I, I, I really like this because it helps me remember, you know, kind of the four pillars, I think, that... Uh, of, of wellness. So relationships, social relationships are really, really important. We all know that. And of course, you know, our relationships right now or the way we interact with people is different. Of course, we have to follow the social distancing rules. But, you know, staying in contact with friends and family through video chats, phone calls, things like that, really, really important. Um, routines. So uh, Dr. Gold alluded to a number of these already, and I would just kind of echo what he said, that, you know, getting enough sleep. Sleep is, is probably one of the top things, frankly, and uh, many Americans, even before the pandemic, were not really getting enough sleep, and that can take its toll. So I think that's really important. Uh, you know, some form of physical activity. You now, again, for our folks working uh, on farms and ranches, you're, you're probably quite, quite busy during the day physically. But for the rest of us that have desk jobs, you know, it's really important that we build in some physical activity. I think it's really important. 30 minutes a day, something like that is really, really helpful. Dr. Gold alluded to or talked uh, directly about, you know, healthy diet. And I completely could not agree more that that, uh, you know, health, especially emphasizing fresh fruits and vegetables, five to seven. That's what I recommend, you know, aim for five to seven servings a day. Really, really helpful. Um, you know, just taking care of one's hygiene, that sort of thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, we let some of those things slide when we're uh, under stress, but that's, uh, those are good. So routines, so, uh, sorry, um, uh, relationships, routines, uh, and then relaxation. I mentioned before some form of that. And again, that can be meditation. It can be listening to music. It can be reading, whatever works for you. But then this last one, really haven't talked much about reflection. Uh, 
Uh, that can take a lot of different forms, but uh, one of the best ways I know is to keep a gratitude journal. There's actually a science to that too, that if you um, have yourself, get a, if you get into a pattern, writing down things you're grateful for that happened to you that day. Uh, you don't have to do it every day, once or twice a week. Literally write down uh, things that you're grateful for or thankful for. It actually changes your outlook on life. It helps you look for the positives. Remember I said before that the human brain is kind of naturally sort of apprehensive and kind of tends to look for the negatives. That's kind of the way we're wired. But over time, uh, if you do something deliberate to focus on the positives in your life, it actually does tend to make you feel more content and uh, more relaxed. Yeah, we give so much power to the negative. It's it's overwhelming. A Facebook post, for example, you get 52 great comments, one negative one. What's the one that we fixate on? It's just the way our minds work, unfortunately. I love having this conversation with the two of you. We're going to pause for a quick moment for a break, but we will have more Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold and psychiatrist, Dr. Steve Wengel. Mark in Texas writes, there's a surge of cases in a town 35 miles away from our ranch. So we're staying isolated, but I'm overdue for a checkup. How long can these hot spots last before they simmer down? Well, you know, Mark, we've watched these hot spots uh, come and go across the United States now, going back to uh, early March. Uh, we've, of course, seen them in China. We've seen them in Europe. Uh, we're now seeing them in South America and other places as well. So they typically come and go in 14-day cycles. And the reason for that is that from the time uh, you or I or somebody is exposed to the virus till we develop symptoms, get tested, test results come out, and then the run the course of the disease uh, tends to be about 14 days, can be as long as 21 days. And so uh, depending upon the nature of the hotspot, so for instance, if you look at some of these long-term care facilities, uh, senior citizen facilities, uh, where people are really living in very tight quarters together, sometimes they do last longer. Mm -hmm. It all depends upon how much uh, they can isolate the patients mm -hmm. that are uh, infected. Now, when that comes to the community, it can be a very different kind of situation mm -hmm. because if they're spread within the community, particularly through large groups, uh, such as, uh, you know, for instance, there was a large example now of choir practice where mm -hmm. I think 97 people mm -hmm. were exposed to one person who was uh, ill, didn't even realize that they were ill, were mm -hmm. singing during choir practice, and over 90 people uh, on that choir, uh, ultimately got infected uh, with COVID-19. That was a sort of one and done kind of event, as opposed to the long-term care facilities, some of the meatpacking facilities, uh, some of our schools, which we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit later. Uh, those tend to be more cyclical in nature and you really have to make a huge effort to block the spread of the virus under those circumstances. All right, thank you for that, Mark from Texas. Our next question is from Emily in Tennessee. Let's listen. What do you think of schools reopening in the fall and how is UNMC adapting to the new normal? Thank you. Well, the University of Nebraska, Emily, has actually been not only planning for the response to the pandemic, but has actually been planning our, quote, reopening uh, since almost late January. Uh, understanding that there would be multiple phases to this pandemic and that we'd be challenged because of traditional education. You know, if you think about it, putting a large number of people in small quarters, be they in classrooms, athletic facilities, dormitories, you know, food service facilities where uh, you have the handling of food, students sitting next to each other. And let's face it, as much as we would like to say that our 17 and 18 year olds are going to do everything exactly right. You know, for those of us that have had the privilege of raising our own families, it doesn't always quite work out that way. No different, frankly, than asking a five-year-old to wear a mask for three hours or six hours, uh, you know, in, in school. So we are planning to be open in the fall. We actually have multiple different plans in place in determining how open. 
And so we talk about this concept called de-densification. I don't even know if it's a real word, but it describes reducing the density of the classroom environment, reducing the density of the athletic practice, reducing the density of, let's say, choir practice or musical performance uh, to a level that we think is reasonably safe. And of course, we want to be sure that we have adequate amounts of personal protective equipment, that if students are symptomatic at all, and we're going to ask them all to use the smartphone app when they come back, uh, that they're pre-screened every day, and that that screening uh, will result in access to the classroom, the research laboratory. Uh, it'll produce access to their dorms and, and to their uh, you know, student cafeterias uh, mm -hmm. as well. But you know, I, I think that if you were to ask me uh, what school is going to look like in the fall, uh, I could tell you what if school started tomorrow, I'd have a pretty good idea about what our community would tolerate, what kind of health care resources we have, how much access to testing, masks, other personal protective equipment that we have. But I don't know what it's going to look like. So, for instance, uh, you asked about the University of Nebraska. We officially open on August 24th. You know, that's uh, almost two months from now. Uh, that's a long time. And we're going to have to be very flexible as we get closer, because if the virus continues to go down in all communities, including ours, uh, we'll have a much more open campus. If the virus does not go down and if the virus uh, continues to ramp up, particularly in the areas of where our campuses are located in Nebraska, or if you were in Phoenix today or if you were in uh, Austin or, you know, some of the cities that we're reading about in the newspapers, that are so challenged these days, uh, Houston, uh, uh, it would be a very different situation. So I guess what I'm saying is we're going to have to play it a bit by ear. All right, one step at a time. And we know that flu season is coming as well. Our next caller is Randy from Georgia. Let's listen. When will flu season start? How bad do you think it will be? Well, the flu season traditionally starts, Randy, uh, sometime after Labor Day. Uh, it's usually when the weather starts to get a little cooler and the uh, days start to get a little shorter. It tends to peak uh, in the fall cycle, sometimes around late November, uh, early December, and then it runs through January and February. The current projections are that it's going to be a significant flu season, that is to say, uh, it's not going to be an easy flu season. Now, I don't know what magic goes into those projections, uh, uh, whether people have a crystal ball or they actually know something about the viruses themselves uh, that are going to cause the flu. And so uh, our recommendation and my personal recommendation, and certainly what I'm going to do, is I plan to get immunized with the vaccine, the flu vaccine, that is, just as soon as it comes out. Mm. Because uh, we, what we don't want to do is confuse COVID with the flu. Yeah. And in the very early stages, they're going to look similar because they're both going to present with fever. They're both going to present with congestion. They're both going to present, you know, frequently with loss of taste and loss of smell. They frequently are associated with, you know, muscle aches and fatigue. Mm -hmm. And it's only later that COVID progresses uh, into a severe respiratory illness mm -hmm. where you really get this profound shortness of breath mm -hmm. that is so hard to deal with, particularly in the older population. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to happen is people are going to get all of these similar symptoms that, that are overlapped between the two. And, you know, as we all know, the flu vaccine is never perfect, but it does prevent a number of cases. And for those that are not prevented, they tend to be more mild and it tends to reduce hospitalization. So my best advice, uh, whether you're in Georgia or any other part of the U.S. or for that matter around the world, is uh, get the flu vaccine uh, when it becomes available. As soon as it becomes available, that's something that you've said to us many times on this program. And, you know, you think of another contributing factor to our stress down the road when it comes to flu season. Let's talk about some of the main reactions, how our mind processes stress and how we can actually reduce the impact of uncertainty on our health. Right. So, you know, the human brain uh, likes predictability. You know, we like things, even though we sort of rebel and we say, gosh, I'm in a rut. You know, if, you're, if, if every day was just like the one before, you might say, gosh, that's kind of boring. I'm in a rut. But in reality, we kind of like predictability and sameness and, and all that. And right now, I think it's pretty fair to say our world is not 
very predictable. The, uh, you know, uh, we've talked earlier in the show about the numbers um, <clears throat> for the coronavirus and things like that. Uh, the news changes from day to day. Our brains don't like it when there's this much uncertainty. I mean, look, you know, there, there's a saying that the only thing constant in the world is change, right? So there's always change, but certainly a lot more right now. And I think that's just highlights the need to do more kind of deliberate things to reduce your stress, whether it's meditation again or exercise, getting enough sleep. I think it's always been important, but I think it's just ever more important right now. These are some of the common symptoms, though, that we are seeing in our patients, in our fellow healthcare providers, and our students. Kind of just sort of a vague sense of unease, like, you know, even if you're not thinking about the virus or what have you, just kind of have a sense like I'm feeling kind of unsettled. Uh, people are sometimes shorter with other people, a little more irritable, a le little less patience, patient with significant others, with family, with coworkers. Insomnia is a big one. And even if you're not having insomnia, you may be experiencing lots of vivid dreams. A lot of people are reporting that, uh, which seems to kind of go along with the stress. Not necessarily nightmares, but just remembering their dreams more. And then lastly, uh, you know, physical symptoms. Not Again, I'm not talking about symptoms of coronavirus infection like uh, cough and, and fever, but uh, you know, I think everybody's body has a certain sign of stress. Could be headaches, could be uh, jaw tension, could be whatever. Everybody has a way of showing stress in their body. And so you might notice, for example, that uh, something you used to have and like, again, getting migraines frequently or whatever that kind of went away might be coming back. Uh, that sort of thing could be diarrhea, could be whatever. Everybody's body, I think, has a different way of showing stress. So those those symptoms often are kind of reappearing now. Mm. For me, I get a very heavy heart. I don't know if anybody out there can relate to that, but I carry around the heaviest of hearts when I'm stressed out, and that mm -hmm. is not fun. George of Utah, he says, I read that healthcare workers and other essential employees may be able to get priority vaccinations when they become available. Is this true? And do you think it will apply to farmers and ranchers? Well, the, there's a lot of planning going on now, George, as to how the vaccine will be rolled out. You know, fortunately, a lot of that work was done earlier when people were thinking about the H1N1 pandemic. Uh, and the vaccination patterns usually involve, one, the most vulnerable population. So that's the older people, the people who are being treated for cancer, people who have heart disease or severe asthma or uh, COPD. And then the essential workers. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously the healthcare workers are essential. The people that maintain our utilities are essential. But clearly the people that produce and the people that ship and the people that deliver our food uh, are also essential because uh, without you, farmers and ranchers, the food supply and the food chains uh, in our country and the fact that we serve much of the world as well are, are going to be limited. So the, uh, the hope is that this will be worked out. My guess is that there'll be some state level component to it because the vaccine will be distributed mm -hmm. through the public health departments of each of the states. And then the states will work through based upon it, what we call a, a vaccination algorithm or a pattern uh, as to who gets vaccinated when, mm -hmm. with an idea of ultimately vaccinating two thirds of the population, you know, 200, 230 mm -hmm. million people. Uh, in the United States before this is all said and done. All right. Well, that about does it for tonight. We have a little bit of time left over for final thoughts. Dr. Gold? Yeah, so uh, again, my final thoughts are very similar to what they are previously, and uh, that is that we still have to be very careful. Uh, we're still seeing very large numbers of new virus cases uh, in large and small communities. And this is certainly true for our farmers and ranchers. So please take care of yourself. Uh, please follow all the very simple rules that we've talked about and take care of your family members. And we'll get through this. We'll be just fine. Absolutely. Dr. Wengel, do you have anything to say, final thoughts for us to remember? Well, you know, Dr. Gold took my line, so that was great. He said it, said it better than I could say it. But take care of yourself and keep an eye out for those around you. Uh, you know, just ask, how are you doing? And then wait and then, you know, listen like to what that. they have to say. I think that's very healing. You yeah. look out for your neighbor and great minds.
apparently they do yeah. think alike. Yes, they do. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it, as always. And thank you at home, UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and psychiatrist Dr. Steve Wingle. If you would like more resources on the COVID-19 outbreak, you can head to Nebraska Med. Dot com. And we will be back here for you next Monday with more Rural Health Matters. As long as the pandemic continues, we are going to be here to help you with your questions. Dr. Gold is here for us every single week. All right, we'll see you next week. Hope you have a beautifully blessed night.